Welcome to the fan of history. I'm going to talk about the sources, the primary sources that we have for the events in Stockholm in 1520 AD called the Stockholm bloodbath. And this is a very academic discussion of the six sources. So um, um, yeah, let's do it. So the event itself was a mass execution of Swedish noblemen and citizens of Stockholm ordered by Christian II, the king of Denmark. The number of victims is uncertain, but I've gone with 82 because that was the number that the lead executioner invoiced the Danish king. So the purpose of this video is to discuss the six sources and uh, which we will be using in the work upcoming on the Stockholm bloodbath. The sources are not coherent with each other and um, it's uh, debated still whether which sources you should believe. So the six sources are the accusation, the verdict, the relation, the proclamation, the defense and the chronicle of Olaus Petri. This is Olaus Petri to the right. This guy deserves his own show and um, I'll talk a little bit more about him when we get to the chronicle. So the first source is the accusation. It is a document read by Archbishop Gustav Troll of Sweden. The Archbishop was a friend of the Danes and he reads this right after the doors have been closed to the great part in Stockholm on November the 7th in 1520. He's reading this accusation to King Christian II but all the people at the celebration can hear him and 16 people are accused of heresy, a capital crime. They have committed illegal acts against an archbishop of Rome or of God and this is extremely serious. It is possible that the accusation itself was verbal and was later written down. Most historians consider the accusation of the archbishop to be authentic, uh, that is that it is what the archbishop really said. But other historians suggest that it was added after the bloodbath to justify the acts of the Danish king. It comes down to us only as part of the verdict. So let's talk about the verdict, the second source for the Stockholm bloodbath. This is the verdict of Council of Churchmen in response to the accusation. This council consisted of Archbishop Gustav Troll of Sweden, uh, Baldenäke, Jens Andersen, the Bishop of Odense, and Bishop Hans Brask, the man who successfully saved himself with a hidden note, we'll talk more about later. Otto, the Bishop of Västerås, and those were the four members of the council. The verdict says that the accusation is correct and the accused were indeed obvious heretics and have to die. Uh, there is a debate whether this was a legal act of the church, that it was formally correct, etc. Or if it was just uh, something that some church people said. But the legality of the verdict is a serious question for later. There is also the relation. The relation is the first narrative of the events. This was written by three priests in Uppsala who were present at the bloodbath, who were in Stockholm during these grim days. It's very interesting, it's written three years after the bloodbath, but the political climate in Sweden had changed a lot in those three years. And these guys, they were priests, they were with the church, and they were in risk of getting blamed for the bloodbath. So they have a very clear again in writing the relation where they must make sure that they are not blamed for the bloodbath because the king of Sweden in 1523, King Gustav, he could easily have executed these three priests for their actions. So the source is kind of um, yeah, not entirely good because of that. There is also the proclamation. This is an official statement of the Danish king Christian II about what happened. It was sent to the citizens of Västergötland, a part of Sweden. And it, it's very possible that he sent this uh, proclamation to all of Sweden, to every corner of Sweden. But uh, this is the only one that survived. Um, 
it's obvious propaganda. The king is trying to free himself from blame. Some of the claims in the proclamation are fairly outrageous, but not as outrageous as the defense. This is a letter from Christian II to the Pope, to Leo X in Rome. It's also dated to November 9th, 1520, which is the date, uh, the second day of the executions. The bloodbath is still going on outside when Christian is writing this letter. And he has to write to the Pope, because the first two people executed at the bloodbath were two bishops. They were ordained by Rome and no no worldly king has the power to execute bishops, but Christian just did. So he really has to make up a story. He makes up a fantastic tale about a gigantic bomb that was supposed to blow up him, blow up the Danish king. But when this conspiracy was revealed, there was fighting in Stockholm. And randomly these two bishops just happened to die in the fighting. It was really sad. And, and this is so outrageous because a lot of people saw these bishops get executed. But that this document is written so early, while the bloodbath is still going on, shows that Christian has realized that this will be super bad for his image in Europe. And it also shows how, an, how extraordinary an, an event the bloodbath was. That this was really an atrocity. Things like this didn't happen in Europe before the 20th century, but here 82 people are dead and somebody has to explain it. Uh, the last, the sixth source, is the Chronicle of Laus Petri, and this is by far the most important source. In fact, I will note when we talk about something from another source than this, but you can assume that anything I say is from this source. There are problems with this source. It is written 30 years after the bloodbath, there is an obvious agenda because uh, Gustav is still the king of Sweden and Olaus Petri is entirely dependent on King Gustav. So he needs to be very anti-Danish, he needs to blame Christian II and the other Danes for what happened. Uh, Olaus Petri claims to have been present in Stockholm and there are later falsifications that right in Olaus Petri in the story. So he does things in the story, but uh, those probably did not happen. And it's possible that he wasn't even at the bloodbath. But still, this is our major source for the stories to come. And uh, these are the only six primary sources. So anything else is constructed much later. And the bloodbath is still a debated subject between Nordic historians. Yes, even Norwegian and Finnish historians are very interested in that. Because at the time Finland was a part of Sweden and Norway was also under the Danish crown. In fact, Christian was already crowned as the king of Norway as well. So I'll be doing more works on more work on the bloodbath. Uh, let me know what you want to see more of. I would love to go into depth about the battles leading up to the bloodbath. Uh, I have to preserve the bloodbath itself for the TV documentary, but I might do something for YouTube as well. Uh, I am pretty fond of this period in history. The reign of Gustav Vasa is very interesting. And my interest is about from 1500 to 1560. So if you want to hear more about 16th century Swedish uh, things, let me know. Thank you for watching.